Everyone, welcome back to the Western Hunting Hub Podcast. This is a Action Center review episode with Howl for Wildlife. It is focused on the Montana Grizzly Plan. So to stay informed, this is a great way to uh, check out what Howl's been producing. And through my partnership with Howl, they send me the audio for this to upload for um, everyone to get informed, to get reached and hear what's going on. So in my partnership with Howl for Wildlife, we have John Stallone covering the Montana Grizzly plan. So enjoy this episode. It's a good way to be informed. Thanks for listening. Welcome to Howlcast. Before we get into this episode, I want to take a few moments to talk to you. First, I'd like to thank you all for all the support that you've given Howl. And uh, I just want to let you know that how only works when you're involved. And the only way we can preserve our way of life is to stay connected to the issues and continue to make our voices heard. Also, I'd like to talk to you quickly about the different ways you could be a part of Howlful Wildlife. At the very least, we hope you will become a PAC member and opt into our emails. This is our free membership program. This helps you stay connected to the issues surrounding hunting, fishing, and wildlife management. Uh, it's super easy. You just, a few clicks, you know, and uh, and you're in. It's pretty easy. And next would be our paid membership, which is a $30 a year membership. And this gives you access to deeper discounts, more rewards, and special giveaways. Lastly, I want to talk to you about our partnership programs like Go Hunt and now Pope and Young Club. With the Go Hunt program, you can go to their website right now and you can buy their membership for $149 or you could purchase it from Howl and you would get our $30 membership included free and have access to additional discounts and benefits to go purchase stuff from the Go Hunt store. So it's kind of a no-brainer. You could spend the hundred forty nine dollars to purchase it on their website, or you could spend the hundred forty nine dollars to purchase it on Howl for Wildlife. And when you do so, when you purchase it from Howl, they will give fifty percent of your membership will be donated to Howl for Wildlife. So it's kind of brainless, like I said. I mentioned Pope and Young, so we have a new program with the Pope and Young Club. So if you ever wanted to become a member of Pope and Young, now is the time to do it. Because you can get both the Pope and Young membership and the Howlful Wildlife membership for the same price that you would normally purchase your Pope and Young membership, which is $45 a year. Again, kind of brainless. Get benefits of both. You're helping out both organizations, and you just get way more for your money. One more thing I want to talk to you about. If you use Onyx, I use Onyx. It's an excellent program figure out all my waypoints, figure out how I'm going to get into places, how I'm going to make stalks. There's so many different ways you can use Onyx. It's an amazing product. Um, if you already have it or if you never had it before, you can use the promo code HOWL, uh, H-O-W-L, all caps, and you will save 20% off on that membership. Plus, Onyx will donate an additional 20% to Howlful Wildlife. You can't beat that, right? So you're helping yourself, saving some money. You're helping out the organization. It's awesome. All right. That's all I got for you. Let's get into this episode. All right. Hey, everybody. This is Howlcast. And today we are going to be discussing grizzly bear, if I'm not mistaken. Sometimes I just say wolf because I get the two. They're kind of on the same plane with a lot of people. But no, today is grizzly bear. And with regards to Montana, and we have uh in the you guys are both in the state of montana right now currently right you bet yeah. okay yeah. so we have uh keith kubista is that how i say your last name kubista it's kubista kubista and we also have jeff dara and uh those two gentlemen are both well i'll let you guys kind of introduce uh yourselves keith who who are you? What do you do? And um, and then we'll go to Jeff next. Sure. Glad to participate. And thank you for having us on. Absolutely. I'm uh, Keith Cabista. I'm a 
resident of Montana, have been for upwards of 25 years. I'm in an organization that I uh, more or less helped found back in 2009 called Montana Sportsmen for Fish and Wildlife. And we uh, originated because we were going through the, I'll just call it the wolf wars at that time, where they were listed on the endangered species list. Our game management agency was struggling with it and pretty much politically hogtied to do anything and reluctant to do some stuff at the same time. So a bunch of us formed and decided we'd get in the fray. And we've been at it in that regard on not only wolves, but all game management and wildlife management to protect, preserve the hunting, trapping and fishing rights of not only our members, but citizens throughout the state. And so many things are affected with wildlife overlapping agricultural industries, land use, private property rights, et cetera. So we work on all of that, but our primary function is to uh, ensure that our members and our citizens continue to enjoy and appreciate the right to hunt, trap, and fish. And I'm a director in the organization now. I'm a past president of the organization. So uh, I've kind of been around through the early days and the later stages of everything that we've been involved with. And i uh, be happy to answer any questions about our organization, as well as anything that we're engaged in right now which happens to be primarily fending off lawsuits by the radical enviros against wolf hunting and trapping, as well as trying to get grizzly bears delisted in the state and under state-based management. I'll leave it go at that, and uh, Jeff can pick it up probably. He's uh, the smart one of the bunch. <laughs> well, he told me you were the smart one of the bunch, so yeah. I don't know. That's, that's, that's a good, uh, good synergy there. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh go you want me to go or do you want matt to go yeah jeff go ahead yeah okay. well i'm jeff dara and uh i live in the bitterick valley um same as keith uh we're about uh, 30 miles south of missoula montana um i was a game warden for most of my life for the state of montana uh about 27 years before i retired and um I joined Sportsman for Fish and Wildlife. Uh, I was a, a director. I think I've been there, I don't know, four years now, close to it. Um, I was a director uh, like Keith. And um, then our organization decided that they wanted to uh, create an executive director position um, to be a little bit more active. That was one of the things that I heard when I started um, with Montana SFW that they wanted to have their voice heard a little bit more. Um, there are some act there, as any state where there are a lot of resources, there are a lot of sportsmen's organizations and um, some of them, uh, their voices are listened to and are louder than others. And so uh, to get that proverbial seat at the table, you have to have an executive director position. And uh, hence I'm, the first executive director for Montana Sportsman for Fish and Wildlife. And uh, like Keith, um, I've been in Montana for, well, I moved here in 1980 and uh, went to school here and uh, enjoy it. Hunt, fish, trap, love Montana. Awesome. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. By the way, Joe um, at uh, American Bear Foundation says hi. Oh, yeah. I just, we're working on something uh, together and I spoke with him yesterday. I said, I was talking to him about this issue and he said, Oh, he's a good friend of mine. Tell him I said, hi. Yeah. So, yeah. um, and then, uh, Matt, so Matt is a new, the first hire actually <laughs> with, with Alpha wildlife, which I'm really excited about because it's going to take some work, um, off of my back. But, um, Matt, this is, um, sort of the first public first thing we've really done together actually so um who are you who are you matt introduce yourself real quick uh my name's matt Smythe. i hail from western new york is where i live live now uh, i'm a, uh, an army veteran uh writer and an outdoorsman i hunt and fish um primarily primarily archery for whitetail up here um and fish it runs the gamut so you know, if it swims, I love chasing it. Um, I was uh, with Free Range American. I was a 
a senior staff writer for them and wrote a lot, covered a lot of um, environmental and conservation, wildlife uh, issues and uh, wrote, wrote a lot and worked a lot with Charles um, on different issues that, that they were trying to bring uh, some, some action to. So uh, I'm excited to, excited to support Char Charles and uh, be part of the Howell organization and really look forward to uh, moving the needle on a lot of these issues. I'm, I'm super excited to have you here. Um, yeah, your, your work with Free Range American and all the other guys over there have been honestly really invaluable to, to us because I didn't have anybody writing anything. Um, and I'm not really that smart and I'm not a very good writer, so I rely on a lot of people, but, um, but anyways, um, I'm Charles, I'm the, uh, president and founder of Hall for Wildlife. And basically what happened was I saw, uh, I think a couple of people probably messaged me as generally how this works, or somebody sent me an email that, um, there's going to be an issue going on. And this one happens to be in Montana and it's going to have something to do with grizzly bears. So, Jeff and I have spoken in the past. I can't remember what about, but I said, I know a guy in Montana. So I, I think I called you or emailed you. I said, Hey, um, this is what's going on. Are you going to be involved in this? And he said, yep, we absolutely are. And so we had a, a brief conversation. I said, let's just do a podcast. Let's not even talk about it. Um, really let's, let's figure this out through a podcast. And what we're going to do is kind of educate everybody on what's going on, educate myself and Matt, and we're going to take from this, um, and develop an action, um, that, uh, that the public can then use through our website to, to, you know, get involved in this grizzly issue. And basically right now it's, and correct me if I'm wrong, the department is going to have a, a new grizzly bear management plan. And right now they're accepting public comments up until I think January 5th or January 6th. So that's where currently right now, where I think we can get involved is just um, letting everyone know what the issue is and here's how to make comments. And here's some suggestions about those comments based on these conversations and, you know, based on kind of the, I think the experts in the field. Um, so we are, we're starting with, you guys seem to be pretty good uh, references that I've, that I've gotten on this and other people that I've talked to that said, Oh man, that's going to be a great, like, those are the two guys to talk to So I'm excited. Um, this is just an open, you know, don't wait for me to ask you or whatever. I just want to know what's going on. So let's just start with, you know, whoever, um, what exactly is going on? What's the history? You know, there's a lot of, uh, controversy, I guess, or whatever surrounding grizzly bears. What's going on? Well, well, I'll I'll start. I guess uh, as as everyone knows, the grizzly bear is a is a listed species on the Endangered Species Act, and it has been now for decades. Um, Montana, the state of Montana, the governor has filed a petition with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to delist the. Uh, Montana is not alone in that effort, in the fact that. Wyoming has done the same thing uh, with the greater Yellowstone ecosystem and uh, Idaho is, has also filed a petition to delist the grizzly bear. Um, that petition, I know for Montana, I can't speak for the dates of the other two states, but was filed just about a year ago. Um, and generally, uh, the general public was under the impression that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service had 90 days to uh, reply to that petition. But in reality, it was, they have a year. And um, the US Fish and Wildlife Service still hasn't answered uh, the petition by Governor Greg Gianforte. So we're not sure if it's gonna be, if the bear is going to be allowed to be delisted or not. Um, but what we're talking about here today is, is a draft management plan for grizzly bears by the state of Montana and the Department of Fish, Wildlife and Parks. And uh, they've had uh, the, the plan, they actually had two plans in existence, but they, they, they're they kind of antiquated. Um, and I'll 
explain one of the reasons why, but um, the two plans were for the bears in the western part of the state and then in the southwestern part of the state. So with the word delisting being said more than it has in decades uh, now, um, this plan that has been put together has actually been worked on by, um, trying to remember his name now, Dr. Harris, I believe is his name, uh, put this plan together. He's been working on it for two years. And there's um, something that has happened uh, during that time frame was that the previous governor appointed a grizzly bear advisory council comprised of citizens of uh, all walks of life in Montana. And they met several times. And I know Keith listened to just about all of those meetings. Uh, I attended a couple. Um, and anyway, that there was a lot of input uh, on grizzly bears and, and how, they, how the citizens felt they should be managed. Well, that input needs, is going to be incorporated in this draft plan. So it's, it's kind of twofold. It's going to consolidate the state's plan into one plan instead of two. And it's going to combine a lot of that effort that was put out with that uh, advisory group uh, on grizzly bears. And so right now there's a plan that's out for the public to see and uh, look at. There's kind of a short turnaround. There's a 30 day, uh, kind of like a 30 day window to get uh, public comment on this plan. And uh, in discussion with the department, there's a reason why. Um, delisting decision hasn't been made and to not have uh, a current plan in place probably wouldn't bode well for delisting so I, did i cover it kind of good keith did i forget anything yeah i think that that brings it up to to date where we are now i'll, I'll just add a few things and the, the one other important thing is combined with the plan there's a requirement to do an environmental impact statement. That's also a part of the comment review process. Yeah. And from my perspective in dealing with some of these, I'll just call them uh, antis in the past, they're gonna hone in on a lot of those things. And that's where we're gonna need Howell's help along with other people's help to insist that this plan as well as the EIS is sufficiently documented science-based data inclusive that can produce a delisting at a certain point, but more than anything, to allow state-based management of the grizzly bears, similar to the way the wolf process went. And right. it's important to note at this point that uh, all the recovery criteria for the two ecosystems, Greater Yellowstone, as well as the Northern Continental Divide, have met that criteria years ago, and both times the delisting efforts were overthrown in litigation sponsored by the NGOs. And that's what we're trying to avoid now here is to do a, I'll just call it a, a fail safe if there is such a thing program that can avoid those type of things. Because these NGOs despise state-based management of wildlife. It it's goes against a lot of what their activities that they deem appropriate are. And that's mainly re relating to hunting and lethal control. That's actually easier to manage grizzlies than it is to acquire management authority. I mean, we, we've struggled with that with the wolf and we're struggling it with the grizzly bears now, but support for this plan is essentially what's needed because without that, these groups are gonna prevent the listing once again after that rule is made by the US Fish and Wildlife Service. So one of the key things I wanted to mention and the plan goes into it is, and that's why we're involved is uh, we've laid a very consistent foundation referencing hunting of grizzlies in statute, regulations, plans, agreements, and a number of documents. So it's really critical and imperative that we continue to embed that within any plan as well as EIS studies. The current documents do that in a, I think, pretty nebulous way. And I can understand why, because they don't want to give all of the detailed information, which will then become targets. But sure. it's a well-documented scientific hunting 
potential program that not only the department looked at and reviewed, but the Grizzly Bear Advisory Council looked at it and overwhelmingly supported it as well. I think there were 18 or 19 members on that council and all but two of the hardcore antis supported the role of hunting and a future management of grizzly bears. So um, I think that is about the only two points I wanted to add uh, at this point and maybe let you guys jump into questions or other things where we can address those. Well, <clears throat> one thing that I, I'm not, I'm not sure of, but I'm involved in a lot of states issues and I've involved in a lot of commissions recently. And, um, I see different groups, anti-hunting groups, or maybe they don't call themselves that, but they basically are. Um, and, and they go after states that do not have updated management plans. Um, and then they will say something, I mean, exactly what you're saying. They'll go after the environmental impact or they'll go after, you know, they'll say, well, in California recently, um, they actually got, <laughs> they got turned down. They'll say all the, uh, all the wildfires in California are, um, just wiping out the black bear population. Well, right. what they didn't know is our biologists were actually studying this to, I didn't even know it actually, um, all sorts of data points out there. And they actually said, well, actually the wildfires are helping the black bear population because of all the new growth of food. And there's nothing that supports that these wildfires have killed off, you know, such and such number of, uh, of black bear. And in fact, our black bear population is at least 35,000. And by the time we're done with this study, we might find we have 70,000. So HUSIS, the Humane Society of the United States, was not ready for that data. Um, but in some states where they don't have that data, man, do they they go after that. And you're just left defending something that you don't have any data for at the current time. So that's that's where they that's where they win. But I do want to just touch on black or not black bear, grizzly bear i'm so used to black bears that's all i've been dealing with lately but grizzly bear um hunting and i just want to hear from you guys i mean I, I i'm pretty sure i know the answer but i wonder sometimes if people think that we think there should be grizzly bear at all you know so are we managing grizzly bear or do we not want grizzly bear and um because it it when i read their i'll just ask you that what do you what's the what's the statement as far as you know is is do we want a population of any grizzly bear whatsoever in montana oh yeah i i would say absolutely i mean uh it's an iconic species it's our state animal they're cool to see um in no way uh, does our organization advocate that uh, there's an open season on grizzly bears? We know that if there gets to be that day that there's a hunting season on grizzly bears, that it'll be very, very regulated. Um, and, and I'm sure there will be instances where, I mean, about 80% of all grizzly bear death right now is human caused, one way or the other. Um, and the number one way a grizzly bear dies by that human cause is generally a vehicle strike mm. or, or a conflict. In other words, the grizzly came down and ripped the door off the chicken coop and killed the chickens. So grizzlies, <clears throat> grizzlies are being lost every year. Um, I, I know in the GYE, the greater Yellowstone, they're losing 50 to 70 bears a year. Same in Montana and the NCDE to conflict and um but as far as hunting goes i think keith would agree we, we we don't see the day where you'll be able to go to walmart or whatever license agent you choose and buy a grizzly tag over the counter and go hunt grizzly bears we don't see that at all um i think there will be you know an opportunity someday uh for for someone to harvest a grizzly bear but again, using the North American model of conservation, uh, one of the tenets of that, of that model is hunting. And um, if the population supports it, then we support it. And, uh, that's, I, that's how I look at it. 
I just wanted to make that comment because a lot of people listen to, I know the other side listens to this and I see all the time in comments and it's, it's frustrating to me. Yeah. I'll see some hunters and it's, you know, I'm, this does not represent the hunting community, but when one person says something, that's what the other side uses as to paint all hunters. And I'll see all the time where it's like, you know, wipe them all out, kill them all. We don't want them all. And I'm like, well, that that's ridiculous. You know, that's not what we should be saying. That's not what we should be thinking. We, it's management. We want these animals, but they need to be managed. There's a, there's a, a um, you know, we kind of use our biologists and we use scientists and we use all this data to kind of control what's going on. You know, too many predators is going to have an effect on ungulates. And it's also going to have an effect on predators because they're going to run out of food. We're actually, I think this is, we actually try to save wildlife through hunting and through management. Hunting is used as a tool. But I just wanted to make that clear because this is obviously one of those polarizing subjects, I guess, you know. So I wanted to make that clear for anybody listening. None of us are ever going to advocate for we don't want any grizzly bear or anything like that. It's just actually proper management, which in my view, I think is actually good for the grizzly bear and all other wildlife around it. Um, that's important for people who don't understand hunting, I think, to 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 know there. Um, I'll just add a couple things to that, Charles, because I, I think you and Jeff touched on it really well. And I, I would uh, point out that within that grizzly bear advisory council, as well as the general comments that came in, sure, there's some from left field that talked about crazy things. But the predominant point of view is, yes, grizzly bears are important to have on our landscape, as Jeff pointed out. But there's also a way to manage them in ways that create sustainability, not only for the population, but to, for the ability to hunt them someday. And just as you said, our conservation principles go way back within the hunting community and the trapping community for that plan, for that perspective. Um, and the primary key to minimize the killing of adult females is the major thrust that produces a slow growing but growing grizzly bear population that can produce a surplus. Science-based data confirms that, not only with grizzlies, but with a lot of other species, as you know. And so I think it's important at this point to point out that there is a memorandum of agreement that was signed by three states, Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming, right. that really delved into the specific details for allocating discretionary mortality of grizzly bears. And each state has their own mechanisms and their own formulas that determines what they want to do with, I'll just call it the surplus bears. And this was signed by all three parties. It evolved into, I think, a, a two or three iterations. And it's important to continue those type of things because the framework that comes out of that eventually for individual state-based hunting seasons will not imperil the grizzly bear populations, period. That's something that you don't see the other side talking about at all. Hmm. And, and I think th there's for good reason. You mentioned the fact there's a predator-prey balancing situation that goes on. Well, I think the predators are used as a primary vector in many cases by a lot of these groups to do more than control what they want to see controlled as far as reforming wildlife management. It controls a lot of land use issues. It controls a lot of other things that are on their agendas. And I don't want to get too deep into the weeds on that, but we all know that it's a bigger thing than wildlife management to these same groups because the same players are involved in all of those issues and, de and deals that are going on. Right. So um, I, th I think the other side of this is there's a lot of, I'll just say whining about trophy hunting. Yeah. Partic particularly when it comes to uh, grizzly bears, it's irrelevant to the bears or for that matter, to any species that are killed. The populations don't care. And all of our hunts and our sport fisheries have some trophy component and it's never going to go away. Sure. Yeah, no, absolutely. What, you know, touching on that with in the management plan, um, 
when would hunt when would grizzly bear i don't know if it addresses this when would one be able to hunt a grizzly bear in montana if they were delisted and this management plan gets approved when would that go into effect let's just say it was delisted you know tomorrow well it's clearly what? not addressed yet in the management no. plan um no. you know and, and 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 probably for a good reason you know um we don't know uh, i guess is the best answer um you know, I, I know it's controversial with black bears. The spring bear season is always controversial, and, and what have you. But, yeah. but we don't we don't know what that would be like. Mm. Um, okay, got it. And, and then, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to add briefly. Uh, I think it'll follow somewhat the same trajectory of creating a framework for a hunting regulated hunting season of grizzly bears, similar to what the wolf did when they came off. Of course, they vacillated back and forth, off on, off on, based on litigation but it'll go through a pretty lengthy public process, both in what they're going to intend to do under that. And then it has to go through an approval by the Fish and Game Commission in Montana and other states that may have delisting of grizzly bears before it ever sees the light of day of issuing a very limited, probably permit system on a very small yeah. scale. Yeah, for sure. And, and this, I don't think you touched on this, this management plan, is that, is this for areas outside of Yellowstone, that, that, that ecosystem, what, what areas is, is, does this um, management plan include? Cause I know there's, there's something separate for the, what is the terminology where the bears that are close to or inside of Yellowstone, and then there's sort of the bears that are in the middle of the state further away from Yellowstone. What is, what is, do you know, understand what I'm saying? Okay. It's the recovery areas, right? Recovery areas versus their potential range or where they're ranging outside of recovery areas now. Right. That's what they, the, uh, the management plan touches on, at least from the maps that I've seen and some of right. the line. It, it, and what I like about the plan is it, it does, I mean, it addresses all grizzly bears in Montana, but, uh, you know, we have the, the NCDE, which is generally the Bob Marshall wilderness and surrounding front countries. And um, then we have a portion of the greater Yellowstone uh, on the southwest corner of the state. And then we have um, the cabinet yak uh, area. The bear number there is is really low, but the NCDE is really the big area for us in Montana on bears. But what I like about this plan is, you know, that the key word is interconnectivity between mm. those those uh, ecosystems, and and we've learned now because we've been in court so many times over these issues that the science and the biologists and all the criteria have been met and we get into a courtroom and a judge says, well, I don't see genetic sharing. I don't see interconnect or connectivity between the ecosystems. And those weren't things that were in the ESA necessarily, but we know it's important, you know? So the plan, as the draft says, it, it, it talks about uh, augmentation, potential genetic sharing between ecosystems and moving bears, uh, you know, from potentially the NCDE to the cabinet yak or the GYE or wherever. Um, so I think the plan is good that way, but it, it also allows for, um, I mean, in Montana, we're seeing bears where there haven't been bears for a hundred years yeah. and they're out in the plains and um, they're, a lot of them are getting in trouble, you know? <laughs> so um, if we had a plan where the, the biologists could treat those bears potentially differently than a, a bear that was, you know, in the NCDE. And if the bear was good, you know, not causing trouble, it could be handled uh, left alone in those areas. But if it was causing human conflict or depredation, it could be treated differently. So. The flex, I guess the key word in this plan is flexibility. So it's a management plan for the entire state. For the whole okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's what I would, that's what yeah. my question was. Cause I saw the the map and, and I kind of on purpose 
went into this i don't know if it's a good idea or not when went, went into this i didn't want to like really look at much i just wanted to ask you guys questions as if i was a a person living in california who has no idea about grizzly bear because i don't we don't have grizzly bear here so it just not something that i think of so that's that was kind of my my route to take here was to be completely ignorant on all subjects and just ask you these questions because i think it i think for for the most part most people really have no idea about grizzly bear they have no idea about wolves they they see pictures of them they hear about them they you know i mean i've i've been in um uh, in um uh yellowstone i've also been in glacier national park uh a lot of backpacking there i've seen grizzly that's it i've seen them <laughs> in glacier but i don't know anything about the ins and outs and you know what really the problems are and you know i see leonardo dicaprio you know making videos about stuff or whatever and that's just kind of what the public sees and you take a side you know and 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 a lot of it is you know if you're a if you're a hunter you kind of understand one side of it and if you're not a hunter and the only thing you've seen is you know some video from leonardo dicaprio then you know now you have that opinion um it's just interesting how 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 um just crazy this whole subject is so anyways that's why i'm asking those questions is just for the pe person who knows nothing like okay. me so well, I, I, you, go ahead matt i'm sorry um uh, one of the i guess there's two items when see i on the other hand i i wound up sitting and reading i'm a nudge like that i yeah. so i dug into the the management plan and the one thing that i was struck by and i mean we're speaking about the um the inclusion of hunting as a management tool in this in this plan the interesting thing is is that um hunting as a tool in this management plan is actually a very it's a very small part of the overall plan um there's so much more i mean it's there's i maybe four or five pages that speak to that speak to hunting there's more that speak to the values that are that were weighed um both on the hunting and the non-hunting side um you know that those that um, our ordinary citizens versus those that are, you know, the hunting public and what have you. Um, and so it, that, it struck me as, you know, what the, the management portion, the hunting management as management is, uh, it's a small part. It's very important, but it's, it's a small part of, of everything that has been uh, going on as far as research for this. Um, one of the other things I, and I wanted to double check is there's, there's actually, um, with this draft, there's, there's alternative A and alternative B um, with it. And I think we're interested in alternative B. Is that safe to say, Keith and Jeff? Yeah, 100%. In fact, alternative A is a long-term continuation of listing the grizzly bear proposal. Obviously, alternative B goes into the depth that you alluded to far beyond the hunting aspect. The management, it's a complex plan that as Jeff pointed out, this Dr. Smith wrote over the two year course of time, integrating all of these things that were done in the past from the early days in the nineties of the early plans that are basically out of date and out of science based data, all the way up to the present delisting requirements and thresholds that have been met. But in order to avoid these continuation or this incessant litigation, they delve into those type of details predominantly on those management category alternative B scenarios. And you can just compare alternative A to B and see the sort of volume they went into on the alternative B scenarios on those alternates on how they would manage the bears, not only with the use of hunting that took up about what, 10 lines versus 180 pages. <laughs> you know, it was really minimal, as you said there, Matt. But I think the key to it is these grizzly bears accurately described in the plan are conflict prone animals. Mm. That's the basis on which they had to go into a lot of detail on dealing with the various, not only conflicts, but potential conflicts that could arise. And again, they wanted to make this plan, in my opinion, and I think 
as Jeff talked to various people in the department, they wanted to make it pretty bulletproof on dealing with those scenarios in the conflict management, predominantly outside of the recovery zone, which are labeled as, I think, demographic monitoring areas. There's so many classifications of areas, whether it's connectivity related or demographic monitoring or designated populations, and you know, just pick an acronym, it's out there. But they painfully went into details about that, knowing that this plan and the EIS would be scrutinized. So I, I think it's, again, I think the theme of today is that we, we wanna encourage statewide and national support, which probably doesn't exist very often on positive feedback and commentary. And, and that's the thrust that I think I'll leave it up to, to Jeff's discretion, but I, I think that's what we want to have come out of this podcast and future uh, abilities working with you guys is we so often hear, in fact, that the, Jeff can describe the latest wolf management seasonal setting process. There were so many well-dressed people from Hollywood there and Australia and London and what have you. We rarely get that in a positive feedback forum on these plans that we do or these seasons that we have. So it's, it's kind of refreshing to engage with you guys on that opportunity on a broader scale or a broader range basis. So. And that's what I'm getting out of this is this, this management plan has a lot more to do than hunting. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's what I'm gathering. Yeah. A little bit about grizzly bears too, you know, in the fact that I worked with them for a long portion of my career is um, they are an apex predator, Mm -hmm. right? And they, they cause human death. Um, I mean, just, just last summer, um, a lady was a bicyclist who camped in a small town Yep. in the front yard of a post office, which I'm sure she felt was safe, was drugged from her tent by a grizzly bear. And I've had to investigate uh, human death caused by grizzly bears. And livestock producers also lose. I mean, I, I counted the other day, we're over 70 cattle that have been killed this year by grizzly bears. And we're near 50 sheep. So and I hunt exclusively in grizzly bear country. I'm a hunter. And uh, I see grizzly bears frequently. Um, the other day I was out with my daughter. And it, she's a first time hunter. Um, she's not, she's 25. But uh, we were walking back and I saw a couple blood trails of successful hunters dragging their animals out in the snow. And we ran into another hunter. And he said, did you see the grizzly tracks? And, and I, I hadn't because there were quite a few tracks in the snow. And he said, last weekend, a guy was dragging out his deer and uh, a grizzly bear basically followed him all the way back to the, the parking area where his car, his, his vehicle was. So, I mean, we live amongst them. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and some of the bears are good, don't cause any problems. And some of them aren't so good. Uh, we have hunters every year have to surrender their game to bears. Yeah. You know, so anyway, just thought I'd throw that out there. With, yeah. with grizzly. <laughs> go ahead, Matt. Yep. That, um, that's a great statement. We live among them. It's not the other way around. You know, they, this is no. their, this is their country. Um, and mm-hmm. I think that that's something that, it, you know, we need to, the support for a good management plan, I think part of that is, just, I mean, it's public safety, right? It's inevitable that the grizzly population is going to continue to grow and is going to continue to expand. They're going to head out into new territory. They, I mean, they have to, they just won't, they won't stay in the same area in, in giant numbers. So it's, it's an inevitability that, you know, they're going to be in places that people haven't encountered them um, or that haven't been encountered in, you know, 80, hundred years or whatever. So um, 
having more than just hunting, having that in place so that people, the, you know, public safety is, is taken care of is, is important, which is that, that is, that is, I think the, that's the topmost um, priority for them in this plan is public safety. Uh, as far as management is concerned, obviously the health of the population, the grizzly population, but uh, managing for, for safety as well. So so when there's a problem grizzly right now what 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 happens if so that bear that that killed that woman in front of the post office what what happened with that bear or or another scenario what happens right now well they'll they'll send a team and you know they they try to get the right bear um and, and believe it or not i've i've had a human fatality that i was uh heavily invested in on an investigation and and uh even when you trap the bear at the site um we get calls from around the world basically challenging the the wildlife agency to prove that that was the offending bear Mm. you know and even with that the number of uh people that you know, will comment and say, well, the bear was just doing bear, what bears do and, and, and what have you. Um, yeah. You get a, a large number of those comments, you know, and, and uh, it's kind of disturbing in a way, um, you know, uh, there are good bears and there are, are bears that aren't good bears. And, uh, you know, um, but I, I, generally you investigate, you try to, you know, you try to trap the bear and a, a lot of DNA work is done. Sometimes we have to, you have to keep the bear, you know, in captivity until the, the DNA work is 100% sure that you have the offending bear. Uh, a lot of times cubs are involved. Um, it's really hard to place cubs in zoos anymore. Uh, the zoos are full. They don't, they don't want grizzly bears. Uh, yeah. You know, so it's not like you can rehab them and, and, uh, if the bear is over a year old or close to a year old, they can be left alone and generally have a pretty good chance of survival. This might seem like a stupid question, but I know there's a big difference between black bear and, and grizzly bear. I've been charged by, I've bear hunted quite a bit, but it's been black bear. I've been charged by black bear where we just surprised each other. Sow had cubs, scariest moment of my life, scariest 12 minutes of my life actually while I was trying to it just it was just bluff charging me over and over again but um I see you know where I live and 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 different things that happen say with mountain lions or black bear or whatnot um I'll see big differences where there's human pressure put on human pressure by hunting put on animals um, those animals are going to react much different. They're going to have a fear of humans. And then in other areas where there is no hunting of say a, a cougar or a black bear or whatnot, um, they'll come right in your house and just, they don't see you as a threat. Now, is that, this is where I'm saying this might be a stupid question. Is that the same thing with the grizzly? Cause I know grizzlies are a lot more aggressive. You know what I mean? Now is some of this problem that they, they don't have human hunting pressure so they really they don't have any fear of humans and if you apply that pressure then that would be a a a good healthy fear of humans that they could so there would be less problem bears um if we could start hunting them do you understand what i'm saying i do and i think jeff does I'll, i'll take a stab at it first jeff but i i don't think we'll ever get to the critical mass of being able to hunt enough bears that we would create that fear of humans within that bear population. Mm-hmm. You mentioned the 30 to 50,000 black bears. We're never going to get there in grizzlies in Montana and all these other states. So I'm reluctant to say that it wouldn't create some level of standoffish and fear and reaction, but I don't think we'll get to that point because of the limitation that will be placed on it as far as legal hunting pressure goes. Right. Will somebody else, you know, shoot over their head, start firing rounds at them to scare them? It's already happening, and I don't think we've seen differences. And Jeff, <laughs> you, you chime in here, but I don't think we're going to see that level of uh, pressure to influence their behavior. 
I, I agree hundred um, percent. Actually, you know, when I was a warden captain in Missoula, we had numerous instances where hunting was being done in, in uh, heavily populated grizzly areas. And we kind of joke about it and say uh, the dinner bell was rang when the gunshot goes off. But in some cases, that's actually true. Yeah. Um, they, they hear that and they equate that to a gut pile or an animal. And we just got to the point as an agency at the time where uh, if that happened to an individual, you know, we just tell them we'll, we'll give you another tag, you know, and walk away from it. Uh, so I don't, I, I agree with Keith. I, I just don't think there will ever be enough hunting pressure applied that it, that it will uh, deter a bear. Um, they are an apex predator. You know, I mean, you're talking uh, male grizzlies in Montana anywhere from 700 to a thousand pounds. And yeah. uh, that's a big, that's a big animal. I'll just add one more thing to uh, going back into the Grizzly Bear Advisory Council. I sat through a couple of meetings where they brought in experts from Alaska, British Columbia, other parts of the country and uh, North America. And they, they too said they couldn't scientifically say that that hunting, when it was allowed, BC has since rescinded their grizzly season that it did have any effect on those bears activity levels yeah i wonder how long that would take i just i i bring it up i'm just i'm just trying to parallel some things you know there's we have mountain lions here all the time walking down our sidewalks they're on the ring cameras you can't hunt them here now that doesn't happen where you can hunt them um i've also learned from watching people like um bart george in washington hazing isn't scaring mountain lions off he's getting 12 yards away with playing a podcast on a loudspeaker but he's got it collared so he knows where the camera he knows where the lion is so these ideas that oh we can haze and make noises and stuff and that's gonna you know scare away mountain lions and whatnot that doesn't seem to be working either you know they're just outside of a school hiding you know underneath the the, the pine trees and that's the kind of stuff that he's that he's documenting um and the same thing with you know blackberry you go to um you go to our uh, national park here, you go to Lake Tahoe or whatnot, bears just look at you. They could care less, but where I can black bear hunt, they aren't just standing there looking at me. That's for sure. <laughs> you know, so I, I was just wondering with, with grizzlies, I know they are a, a completely different animal. Um, and, and it's, it's something that hunters need to be aware of when they do, when they do shoot, when they do have a gut pile, you know, you might be able to, a black bear generally doesn't want anything to do with you. A grizzly bear is like, well, that's mine. <laughs> I'm gonna come take it. They are a completely different animals. I was just wondering what your what your what your take was on that. Um, with this with this management plan, what do you suggest the public? Are there a lot of different angles here that the public can get involved in? With you know, let's support this, let's support that. Are we supporting the entire plan? What do you do? We want a, the public to add anything. Um, cause that's a part of kind of their ask was we'll develop this plan based on, um, you know, public response, which is sort of opening up uh, to, to complete wildness if, if that's what they're really basing it on. But what is it we want the public to do here with regards to this plan as it, as it exists right now? I'll take a stab at it here first, Charlie. And that is that. I think the first order that we'd like to see is support for the plan in its alternative B, I guess it is, in terms of what that uh, process is currently viewing alternative B as the preferred option. And we would think this support by the public would, would be beneficial in that regard. But I don't think it would hurt to include support for the plan be it small that it is, supporting the hunting role of hunting as part of that support for the plan. I can assure you that the major theme of comments coming in from the other side is absolutely no hunting. And this commission, or I'm sorry, the department, I guess it is at this time, is going to get just overwhelmed with that comment, no hunting, no hunting, no hunting. 
Okay. And I think limp, and I think limp, the other side of it is I think they're going to be also, and, and this is subject to uh, interpretation, but the general public and their mutual ideology thinking is going to create in these connectivity areas, which are the areas outside of the recovery zones. Everything in between is going to be a connectivity zone or a management, uh, demographic management area. They're going to want to see that area treated the same as the recovery zone with limited right. controls and limited management and limited, uh, I'll just say, and they're going to want repressive restrictions within those on humans. Don't forget, this, the primary point of this plan is to manage grizzly bears, not people. And I, I think that's a distinction that we want to hammer in is, and the, the plan goes into that. They go into their areas where they need to discourage bears from being under the human safety aspect. So I, I think as far as reaching out for comments, we're going to want to provide an opportunity for the public to weigh in on supporting the plan under the restrictions that they've gone into about those connectivity areas. Restrictions being not being too tolerant of bears where they're not wanted. What's I don't know the, if I said that right, Jeff, but yeah, that's what we've well, talked you, about in the past. Is, yeah, is, you did. And, you know, Montana is, uh, we're still, you know, uh, pretty sparsely populated, but we're seeing growth, um, you know, every every year subdivisions are, are going up. And, and a lot of these areas, uh, they interchange, and when I say they, I mean the other side, um, or the antis, they use this interconnect or this connectivity or corridor. You'll hear that term used frequently. And, and they think in their thinking that they can create these corridors between these ecosystems where bears will travel with no problem. And that's just that's just a falsehood. That I mean, we have interstates, we have highways, we have people. Uh, I've seen grizzly bears be euthanized because they've killed chickens. And, and you think about that, chickens. You can buy a chicken for five bucks, you know? I mean, so uh, to think that you can establish these corridors where grizzly bears will travel safely from the, the GYE to the NCDE, whether it be with uh, creation of new wilderness areas, which, there's that effort, which we don't want to see that happen, um, and, or uh, maybe paying a landowner for a grizzly bear habitat, trying to create these zones or corridors for grizzly bears to travel, and, and that's just not going to work. They're doing it on their own now. I had a grizzly bear was between Keith and I just a couple of years ago on a golf course, just three miles from my house, you know. And uh, so they're showing up in places where they've never, you know, we've never heard of them being before. Um, What's the future look like both ways? So what, it, that might be a really tough question to, to answer, but let's say plan B, right? That get, that goes through. What does that future look like? What can that turn into? And let's say it doesn't, let's say there's no, let's say there's no hunting or take out anything else, you know, what's, what's the future look like both ways? If it goes with the anti hunters, the other side, if it goes their way, or if it goes our way, what are both of those futures? Can you, what do you think it'll look like 50 years, 25, I don't know, down the road. Keith, you want to take one side of that and I'll take the other. <laughs> you want to take the anti or the hunting side, plan B or plan A? <laughs> well, I'll take the anti side. Okay. Not that oh, to be clear. Them, okay. But... So plan A, is that, that's the anti-hunter side? Is that what you Well, would... not the alternatives that are in the plan, okay. Charlie. Let, let, yeah, let me yeah, be clear. Okay. Be, yeah. Because I think what you're asking is, what happens if we don't write a good plan and there's no management? Yeah. Yeah. And, and maybe that's a better way to frame it. But sure. if that occurs and the antis win or they litigate or however you want to describe it, and this plan doesn't come to fruition and no delisting occurs, then we're going to have more grizzly bears on the landscape, more conflict, more human safety issues, 
less tolerance for the bears. And to build less tolerance for the bears is to, is to not only doom their future, but it's gonna hurt the overall landscape. It's gonna create divisive areas that are right now at pretty peak levels, but it's gonna grow tenfold. So I, I think at some point you're gonna see, and, and again, a, the antis come in many different shapes and forms, but I think you're gonna see them come to a point of realization where they gotta buy into this or it's gonna get worse and if it gets worse, then it'll go the other way. Um, Jeff, you can you can chime in on that, but uh, yeah, if- no, I, I I agree. I mean, we're to the point now where uh, the governor just spoke at uh, Congressional Sportsman's Foundation uh, summit meeting in Bozeman the other day. You know, and he and he relayed a pretty good story of of a, a lady that confronted him about she can't let her kids play in her yard. And mm-hmm. she happens to live on the Blackfoot Indian Reservation. And she has to electric fence around her yard to protect her children from playing in the yard from the bears. So I, I think you'll just get more and more of that. Um, if you go with this plan, um, I don't think hunting is going to necessarily play that big a role in the grizzly bears future even if it's allowed it, it's it's not going it's going to be such a minuscule part of the of the grizzly bear management it um you know but i i think wildlife state wildlife agencies have proven and montana definitely has proven with the management of wolves for the last 12 years that we're not going to wipe them out we're going to manage them like any game species that we manage um we have you know, more wolves today than, than what the antis want to tell you we have. And uh, we set the quota fairly high, you know, 40%. And we don't get to the quota. It takes people that have that ability, that skill, and that desire, and that knowledge to go out and get them. Uh, and that's just not happening. And the same with the grizzly bear. I, I, I think it could be managed by the state tomorrow and with some limited hunting. And when I say limited hunting, you know, you might follow up with a question like, well, what do you think limited hunting is? Yeah. You know, uh, I, to be honest, I I don't think there would be more than 20 bears a year harvested by hunters. That that's just the number I'm grabbing out of the air, but I don't see large numbers of grizzly bears being harvested by hunters. Okay. Uh, Yeah. So what's okay. What is the plan now? And what is this new plan adding that doesn't exist now? So I think you, you've been, I mean, 20 grizzly bear a year, that's obviously not going to have, um, I'll bring in New Jersey really quick. So the, the, the governor, he banned uh, black bear hunting in New Jersey in 2018, right. campaigned on it. And then uh, recently he said, uh, we need a season because there's way too many problems with black bear. And Houston sued and that lasted for three days and that got overturned. And now there's a black bear season in New Jersey because things just got too bad and they needed to bring hunting back in because hunting it's, it's different type of hunting, obviously black bear and grizzly, but hunting plays a significant role in, in that. Um, with this, what is, what is being introduced in this new plan that, that isn't there right now? Well, I think a couple of things that are introduced besides the hunting aspect that could occur at a future date if the numbers and the science proves it to be doable. The conflict management and how you deal with bears and how you manage bears is, I think, one of the key differences between the old segments of the plans, both A and B that existed for Yellowstone as well as uh, NCDE, And by the way, both of those areas, Yellowstone and NCDE, have what's known as conservation strategies. This plan, this new plan, identifies what those are in terms of how certain bears will be managed, not only in the demographic areas which are outside of the recovery zone, but some of these connectivity areas as well. So I I think to answer your question in a short version is, if this plan's approved, it gives more discretion and it gives more flexibility to manage 
the uncertainty that comes with the unpredictability of each separate bear. They're all different. They're all, uh, they all react differently. And this plan would allow fish and game agencies, tribal agencies, wildlife services, and all of these agencies, both state and federal that are currently active in the management to do even more based on the occurrence specifics of the bears that are in conflict. It also allows this augmentation and translocation of bears at the discretion of the agencies, which is the sort of side component of hunting. Hunting isn't the only way to control some of the populations and other aspects, but some of this augmentation could be. And the augmentation is gonna transfer bears from point A to point B to seed those recovery zones. Maybe it's the Bitterroot or the Cabinet Yak or the Selkirk or whatever. So other areas could receive bear, Montana bears if this plan is approved. I think that's right, Jeff, the way I read that uh, alternative yeah. B. That's how I read it. What's the effects on, on that grizzly are having specifically to Montana on um, ungulate populations or any other what's what's is that as as their numbers grow are you seeing um any other data to be alarmed about with you know elk or deer or or whatnot does that is that on your radar you know it it it, it is definitely in some areas like uh region one is the northeast corner of montana and uh through this elk management plan that we just went through, um, one of the members of the uh, elk management committee, uh, one of his recommendations was to uh, manage elk where they're not. <laughs> and, and I had scratched my head and I had to go back and, and uh, what do you mean by manage elk where they're not? And what he meant was in region one, it's the most predator rich area in our state. It, it in region one, they harvest more black bears than any uh, region in the state. They harvest uh, a high number of lions, and historically, they've been the leader of the number of lions harvested. And they also have the largest density of grizzly bears in their region. And if you go back historically, in which this member of this group did, uh, he found where it was documented that there were uh, populations of elk like approaching 30,000 in, in region one. And uh, now it's just, it's like 3000 elk in region mm. one, you know? So I'm sure that's, you know, more than just grizzly bears, but um, lions, black bears, subdivisions, habitat change, fire, all of that plays, plays a role. But uh, to come out and say that grizzly bears are having a profound effect on ungulates, I don't know if I can say that. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure in certain locations they are, um, but uh, grizzly bears' diets are pretty pr everything from a huckleberry and a, a moth to roadkill or a chicken or whatever. I mean, they eat a lot of different things. So mm -hmm. I don't see them focusing just on ungulates alone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, got it. There's just some some recent studies that I've. I've looked at it mostly had done had to do with well, black bear and, and mountain lion. Um, but um two studies, the the Blue Mountain elk herd in uh in Washington State, I think seventy five percent of the calves were wiped out and mountain lions were were the uh were the primary culprit of that and black bear being number two. But it's a huge, huge issue. And then there's a, a study in Mendocino County in California where basically the black tail population is in dire straits and they actually um, attributed that to, to black bear um, killing so many fawns. Um, so I just I had some questions if the, if you had any info on that for, for grizzlies, because well, you know, again, I'm just, I'm really not familiar with them. We're yet to understand what impact the additive pressure grizzly bears will have on our ungulates and other wildlife populations, Charlie, because they're not established everywhere yet either. That's a good, how many, do you have any idea how and many grizzly are in Montana right now? Is there a thousands? 
<laughs> just and, thousands. Uh, okay. Yeah. And here's 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 the latest number, Jeff. You, you're probably more on top of it than I am. But I said I was the color commentary guy, so here it goes. <laughs> you know, the last numbers that we've heard was somewhere in the 11 to 1200 range in the NCDE and surrounding areas, and well over 800 within the Yellowstone greater area or the ecosystem. There's some wandering bears in between that probably never get censused. There's also bears up in the Northwest that come and go from both Canada and Idaho. Same thing down in the, the Bitterroots, ironically, have not had any resident populations known to be present, even though they wander from time to time and come and go. But I think it's probably supportable to say that there's a couple thousand in Montana at the very least at this point. Do you yeah. know what it was, um, I don't know, 10 years ago? What was the grizzly bear population? Well, you know, they did this study recently. Jeff, you'll, you'll remember this down in Yellowstone where they went through a recalculation of bears. Yeah. And it grew substantially, I want to say probably by 20%. Yeah, it went from like 750 bears to over 1,000 bears just by changing the method that they used to count the bears. Yeah. Uh, which is, is, of course, ripe for argument by the other side. Yeah. Right. Uh, they're, 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 that's not science in their favor. So that that's yeah. gotta be bad science, you know? So, um, but yeah, I, I agree with the, the number that, uh, you threw out there. Um, I retired 10 years ago, but they, they had a pretty good genetic study, a uh, hair snag study in the NCDE when I was there and they got a pretty good matter of fact, they were shocked at the number of bears that they, that they were able to locate. They didn't think that they, there were that many there. Um, so yeah, I would say a good guess would be a couple thousand bears in the state. So that answers the question why there isn't a whole lot of data on their effects on ungulate, <laughs> on the ungulate population. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, com again, a completely just a looking at a completely different species and, and population, of course. When's the last time a grizzly bear was hunted in Montana? Any I went. the early nineties? I okay. think it was nineteen ninety two was the last year that a grizzly bear was legally hunted in Montana. Okay. And obviously that's kind of strange yeah. since they were listed as yeah. threatened, but um not endangered until I think ninety six or thereabouts. But um and again that it wasn't like they killed a whole lot of them then. That was like a rare occurrence. Right. Got yeah, it. there's. Uh, I found it. It's page page one hundred and two. There's a timeline of changes to grizzly bear hunting in Montana. There you go. So that's the that's just a nice little timeline. But above that, it talks about the history of grizzly bear hunting in Montana. So, does it say what the the, the last year a bear was harvested? Let's see. So, yeah, it would have been 91 because 92, the commission omits grizzly bear hunting season from biennial regulations. State's authority to establish grizzly bear hunting season in NCDE is removed by the Fish and Wildlife Service in a federal rule. So it would have been, would have been, looks like spring. Spring of 91 was the last one because fall hunting was canceled due to federal court preliminary injunction on hunting them. So hmm. it's been over 30 years. Got it. So it's been a really long time. And this, you probably have to search for this too, but do you, did you see what the population of grizzly bear was back then? Does anybody know what it was in 90? No. Okay. Yeah. I'm just wondering. Uh, it's all really interesting to me. And grizzly bear is a absolutely fascinating fascinating creature um that i that i don't i just like looking at it you know i love watching the videos and anything i can see on on grizzly bear and personally i'd love to hunt a grizzly bear someday with my bow i don't know if that's ever going to happen but it's just one of those great challenges that i i think i would like to do you know um right up there with the moose that's that's the other thing with my bow that that'd be kind of my sort of my dream hunts um well, is there anything else that um, 
Well, what we're going to do, we're going to develop sort of an action and break all this down and, you know, basically say, here's what's going on. Here's A, here's B. Um, here's why we think you should support B and get the public involved, you know, in that in as many ways as, as possible. Um, is there anything else you think we should go over or, or, or talk about here to, to help here? Or Matt, do you have any questions? I don't have any other questions at the moment. No, this has been, uh, it's been great to pick your brains on this and get your perspective. Um, definitely given, given us a lot, um, a lot of background to be able to, uh, to put to use, try to motivate folks to get involved, you know, with comments and what have you. So. One thing I would just close with is, is I think there's, there's a, important component to whatever you develop as a comment structure to ask the public to weigh in and support state-based management of their own wildlife. Uh, the longer we struggle with this federal intervention on any species, generally speaking, the worse it is for people living in the state that that exists in, and it doesn't matter what the species are, but it, it it it's particularly frustrating with the bears as it was with the wolves when we go back and forth with the contrived reasons that these NGOs throw at the wall through their attorneys and the federal court agrees with. So I, I think the sooner that the public weighs in, and 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 Montana's probably the best. We've got four recovery zones in our state. Montana's the, the deserving state to get state management control of grizzly bears. And that comes with alternative yeah. B, correct? Correct. Okay. Right. And, and, and something too, if I could just in closing, just because I have some knowledge of the state and the game department, um, the current FWP or Fish, Wildlife and Parks Agency does the yeoman share of work of grizzly bear management now, you know, so it's not like it's this uh, big turnover or a big change of, of how things would happen. We manage bears now. Um, really, the thing that the federal listing does is it puts uh, binders on how we manage those bears and, and they dictate, you know, uh, when a bear can be uh, euthanized or where a bear should be moved or whatever. And uh, the state can do that just fine. I mean, like you said we're doing 90% of the work now. And uh, to put this plan into place and put it back into state management, um, the bear will only prosper. It won't it won't go away. And uh, um, the numbers aren't gonna dip down. They're just gonna continue to grow. It'll just be, ha it'll just be managed in a much more flexible way. For the betterment of Montana, absolutely. specifically. I think that's what's important here, right? Is, yep, is it's for the betterment of what's going on in Montana with the people in Montana in your Montana yeah. situation with your Montana Grizzlies. Not, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and- yeah. That might seem kind of, but that's what the problem is. You're not, you're not allowed to handle your own grizzly bears essentially yeah. and your own, and your own issues that you have there. Yeah. Um, and I know, I, I know what the other side is going to say to that. Of course, that's, yeah. that's their, yeah. they always yeah. know better. They always know better. Yeah. Um, do you have a, do you have a website or anything like that that you can um, direct people to with your guys' with your nonprofit? Uh, we do. What's you, that? Let us have it's, it. Uh, it's uh, just Montana SFW dot org. Mon so sp spelled out Montana SFW dot org. Okay. MTSFW oh. at or dot dot org. Dot org. Yeah. <laughs> you forgot your well, website there make, for a second. I'm gonna just make sure I have it right. <laughs> Make sure that I don't go to it very often. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. I 
I can figure it out also and yeah, that, put it up later or whatever. But that's it. MTSF.org. MTSF. M- Montana. Yeah. M-, yeah. M is a yep. mule. There yep. You Are you on? Is that on? Do you have a social media? Uh, I'm afraid to ask this question since with the website, but are you on Instagram or Facebook or whatnot for us to follow, follow that or, or no? Yeah, we're on Facebook. You are. Okay. Yeah. What's the, what's yeah. that page? Same thing. Same thing. Awesome. Uh, actually, actually there's a, there's a dash between MT and SFW. I don't know if that matters, but it's MT for, dash SW for SF. the website. Yeah. Well, I'll look it up and, and yeah. put it up there so that's easier to figure out. You have to understand, we're like most sportsmen's organizations. We're made up of older guys that aren't computer literate. <laughs> and we, we do have a young lady that uh, does take care of our web page and our Facebook page. So, Awesome. Well, I want to thank uh, Keith and Jeff, both of you guys, for being here for this. And... Um, Matt, I'm sure will. Matt's going to help develop this uh, this action and kind of write out some things um, with with your guys' assistance. And I also think even talking to Joe yesterday, I think the American Bear Foundation they're going to going to take some comments from them and put that into uh, the action and and um, just just help develop different comments that people can send in that they can choose from or whatnot. But just want to thank you guys both for being here. Um, and hopefully it, it educated some people on, on what's going on and kind of look forward to seeing where this goes. Cause it seems like if this gets passed, then you're really going to have a lot of other things to work on. Um, you know, what, with the whole hunting side of thing, you know, what will the, what will the quota be? What will the take be? Uh, lots of different things to work on there, I think, which would be, which would be really interesting, but, um, Thanks again, and I will talk to you guys soon. Thank you. And that's it. Thanks so much for listening. These episodes will be very random. Uh, There's no schedule to the Action Center Review episodes. As I receive them from John, they will be released as soon as possible. So I'm just going to throw them in the mix. They won't count for my episode numbers. They're not going to count for uh, my Tuesday morning release. So you'll just see them show up occasionally. So thanks again for listening. Hope you enjoyed.